With me tonight is Stephanie Joshua, who's the filmmaker of Bushwick Homecomings, The Record. So Stephanie, welcome. Thank you very much. So I want to jump right in uh, with the why. Why this film, Bushwick Homecomings, The Record, 10 years after your first film, which also looked at gentrification in Bushwick? Okay. Well, I would say that um, gentrification is a theme in the film, but it, it touches on so much more. It touches on people's lives, specifically a small cohort of people who were in the original film. Um, but the reason why, um, a few different reasons. One, um, the timing was right. I made the first film in 2006, and um, the film um, had a lot of kind of prophecies of what might happen in that 10 year period. Um, and so it was natural that at some point, we, I revisit this to see actually what did happen, what is what was projected to happen, did that come to fruition? So that, that was the first reason. Um, another reason was that there had been um, some occurrences in the community, um, in Bushwick, in terms of uh, changes, um, you know, this part of the film, the second part of the film opens with the, the declaration of Vogue um, proclaiming Bushwick as the seventh coolest place in the world. <laughs> Vogue magazine. Um, and some other um, things that occurred in Bushwick. And if you grew up in New York, if you're familiar, if you grew up in Brooklyn, you know, and, and most people tell me, my friends who lived in Bed-Stuy and, and East New York and, and Brownsville, kind of, I can kind of consider them the cousins of, of, <laughs> of, of Brooklyn. Um, they even thought that Bushwick, like in the, in the hierarchy of things, you know, they felt like Bushwick is kind of at the low end of the totem pole, and and that says a lot. So to go from that to being the seventh coolest place in the mm. world um, mm. by Vogue, which they proclaimed, I think, in 2016, um, and then the the massive, you know, changes and shifts in population, which I kind of follow and in incorporate into the yes, film, yes. Um, I knew that this was the time to revisit this topic and kind of check back in on what's going on in Bushwick. In that film, that first film, which was about, what, 12 years ago, 2006? Yeah, 2006, yeah. Okay. You feature five young black men who tell their story of Bushwick in the 1970s, 1980s, and what was going on. How did they come to be in your first film? Okay, well, um, at the time um, that I made the first film, I was completing, I was in graduate school, and I was completing my master's degree in sociology and social research specifically. And it was at City College, and you know, shout out to City College. <laughs> um, they have an amazing sociology program. And I was first inspired by a, a paper I had to write. There was a, a pretty famous class, I think it still runs at um, City College, it's called People of the City of New York. Mm -hmm. And this class asked each person to study a group and you had to produce a pretty lengthy paper. And in creating that paper, um, it sparked my interest in what kind of motivated change within communities. Mm -hmm. um, and I was a sociology major. I was doing my research in delinquency. And specifically, um, I was interested in learning about, I had a friend who um, was, who I guess was superficially successful, um, had gone to a really good school, and he, we were having a conversation about, you know, why he, you know, had success versus others who did not have as much success, and he really attributed it to, like, you know, the school he went to and some other things, and I thought about it, and I was, I thought, you know, uh, some of it has to do with where you lived and, mm -hmm. you know, what, in, what, came across your path, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I think that so many people are bright and gifted, but when you live in a neighborhood where there's so many obstacles, mm -hmm. you know, crime, other mm -hmm. things, that does change your trajectory. It's not the only thing, mm -hmm. but it does impact mm -hmm. your trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, so that interested me, and so I was writing a paper about delinquency, delinquency and studying what kind of, what were the, the causes for um, young men, because delinquency is most um, predominantly involved young men. Right, right. Um, crime, why did, what were the, the triggers for people to, young men to be involved in crime? 
um, and have these records, you know, mm -hmm. uh, criminal records. Um, and so in studying um, that topic, I interviewed actually a lot more people. Um, but the, the five who in the film, not many, many of them don't have a, a, a history with crime, but I, w I wanted to ask them the same questions and kind of develop a pattern mm -hmm. of what they all experienced and how it may have impacted outcomes, mm -hmm. uh, impacted their opportunities. Mm -hmm. So that was the original paper. And in studying um, you know, their experiences growing up, taking the train to school, mm -hmm. going through Broadway Junction mm -hmm. on the, on the you know, LJAC line in Brooklyn, um, that's how that paper began. And I felt like it would make a good visual narrative, mm -hmm. a story. Mm -hmm. And in um, writing my thesis, this was my master's thesis, I recorded all of the interviews um, because it, I knew it would be easier for me to transcribe it if mm -hmm. I had recorded them. So how did these particular um, five men, mm -hmm. I want to cut to the chase, mm -hmm. because when you see, which I know you will, what's the 411 mm -hmm. viewers, when you see it, it's in festival. It's on the festival circuit yeah. now, Bushwick yeah. Homecoming's the record. But these five black, mm -hmm. young black men talk about some of them being drug dealers, mm -hmm. some of them being drug users, mm -hmm. some of them selling guns. Mm -hmm. They talk about the crack epidemic. Mm -hmm. yeah. They talk about how violent it was. So how did they come to be publicly sharing all of that? I mean, um, you know, they, they all agreed, and I explained the project to them, um, so in, in understanding that this might be a film project, I, I, t I had taken a film course, um, a couple of editing courses. Um, I explained that this would potentially be a film, not knowing that right, it, I could yeah. make it, but I had mm -hmm. recorded it and let them know. Um, what I look for in who I, who I chose to participate in the final kind of cut was I wanted to ensure that all of the participants had grown up in Bushwick and were mm -hmm. still living there at the time that mm -hmm. the film was shot. Mm -hmm. Because I wanted to kind of establish a consistency in their story. Mm -hmm. um, some of the men had moved away, you know, mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. ha weren't born there. Mm -hmm. um, so that was how I came about the selection. And also, you know, some of the stories had aspects that really helped to support um, creating that narrative of what was happening in Bushwick at that time. At the Absolutely, time I there, which is how we can be thankful to them Absolutely. that they were willing to mm -hmm. share so publicly mm -hmm. about having run drugs, mm -hmm. used drugs, sold drugs, carried guns. Mm -hmm. um, we are very thankful that they shared their story. Absolutely. Um, and I just wanted to find out the process mm -hmm. by which you went and you told me some of it. And so we'll move off that to something else because you talk about how um, you retreated in that time of mm -hmm. one of the young men says every night yeah. there were gunshots. You went to bed hearing those yeah. gunshots every night in Bushwick. Absolutely. Which sounds like a war zone and I think Absolutely. one of the young men actually used that word, you know, that term war zone. You say though that you retreated mm -hmm. and you um, became a stay-at-home bookworm, yeah, yeah. but you also say for others, especially young black men, that wasn't an option. Absolutely. So tell me about that. Okay. And I do want to say I knew everyone that I interviewed in that film. That's, ah. that, that's how I was connected with them. Okay. I grew up in Bushwick, so I don't, if you didn't grow up in Bushwick, I don't think that you could have made that film because they need to, they need to trust and know who you are. So I knew everyone there. Um, Did your brother that, know them? Because yeah. later on you mentioned something about your brother yeah, who called you up and told you about Pooh Bear. Yes. Okay. Um, you know, Were I'm, they your brother's running buddies or was he sort of, he, you know, like you know people around the neighborhood. Yeah, you know in your area, Bushwick is not a community that you went to unless you live there. Ah. Um, so I knew every, these are people I went to school with, my family knew, there's a certain trust. That, yes. that went, so when I was yes. making this project and said, hey, will you do this? I think there's a certain amount of trust because totally. they knew I lived there. Props and to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so going back to my story and sharing that um, I kind of retreated, um, I was, a, I call myself a nerd. I was a nerd. I liked, I did like to study. I um, did spend a lot of time doing my homework <laughs> and my mother was fairly strict too so we weren't able to hang out late and, and most people after dark they they were not out in mm -hmm. Bushwick even mm -hmm. if you live there. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that as a woman, as a female especially back then, 
Um, this is an aspect in the first film. Um, we spoke. We talk about the code of the streets, mm. which is. Um, not held the same way for women back then as it was for men, but if you kind of went home early, uh, a woman could probably walk down the street. You were still vic subject to crime, and that that without a doubt. But there was a certain expectation, I think, for young men to kind of not be soft. Mm. And what mm. that meant was, um, mm. you know, you had to people, you had to establish yourself. Mm. Um, if you just went home, you know, after school mm -hmm. and did your homework, you were considered soft. Mm. That that is what it was. Mm. And so. I think that it was okay for women to do that. And again, I want to reiterate, women were subject to yeah. crime, without yeah. a doubt, I was as well. Mm -hmm. But I no, think you talk that about how you had your neck, your gold my chain, chain ripped off. My chain my house was burglarized while we at gunpoint while we were there. So it er, almost everyone who grew up there mm -hmm. experienced something like that. And that I think the story is very similar for a lot of people who grew up in Bushwick during that time. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's why I think it's a familiar kind of narrative. Mm -hmm. When people hear it, they're like, oh mm -hmm. yeah, I, I remember that. I remember mm -hmm. walking down the street on Pickett Avenue mm -hmm. and somebody snatched a chain or something like wow. that. Mm -hmm. um, that was just life. That yeah, was everyday that, that living. Yeah, that was it. And mm -hmm. yeah, you had to be careful. Still to this day, like I'm very careful <laughs> with any like wearing a chain or jewelry and people are like that, that's not like that anymore but I still you know yeah. still there um, well you touched on something too that I want um, what's the 411 viewers to just think about some and that is you talked about uh, the code mm -hmm. you had to establish cred right. your credentials right. otherwise you were soft and being a soft meant you weren't a man right. and then on the other hand perhaps you know, a different, there were different things expected of, mm -hmm. of young ladies, but of women, but they were still, you Absolutely. know, streets kind of smarts were mm -hmm. definitely required. And in the middle of this, maybe somewhere in the middle, is Pooh Bear. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Pooh Bear because it seems to me, because you dedicate the film to him, because so many of the guys who are hardcore street runners and drug mm -hmm. runners gave such props mm -hmm. to Pooh Bear. So let's talk about Mr. Okay. Well, um, the Pooh Bear, who I would call him Pooh Bear, that's how we all knew him, he was a young man who lost his life in Bushwick. Um, I think that some would say he's one of many who lost their lives there. Mm -hmm. he, he was one of many. But for me and for everyone who knew him, he was that different um, kind of exception in terms of the person that he was. Mm -hmm. You know, after you lived a, a life, you know, you grew up, you reach your 15, 20 years old and you kind of have seen things. He was one of the people that I think that everyone would say, this should not have, ha of all the men there, not that anyone yeah. should be yeah. subjected to that. Sure. It was really kind of a jolt and a shock to mm -hmm. anyone who knew him. Exactly. Um, I mean, because in your film, the first film, mm -hmm. Bushwick um, Homecomings, the first film, you have these, what other people who don't know them personally mm -hmm. would say, thugs, mm -hmm. hardcore street guys, mm -hmm. talking about Pooh Bear as, quote, the sweetest mm -hmm. man. <laughs> they use language yeah. that was so um, touching, right, 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 so yeah. beautiful yeah. Yeah. that Pooh Bear, for me, in your film, mm -hmm. again, uh, you know, just one of the many uh, beautiful things about the film, we could see those young men who were, you know, could be seen as thugs. Mm -hmm. We saw something mm -hmm. in them because of how they saw Pooh Bear. Absolutely. And I think there's this old, this is book, um, it came out a long time ago. It was featured on Oprah's Book Club. It was called um, There Are No Children Here. Oh. And the name of the book, it was about a, a, a country somewhere in Africa. And the title of the book was named because there were children yes. in that, that, that community, but the author was expressing that because of what everyone went through, goes through on a regular basis, everyone here has grown up really quickly. Mm. And that's what mm. we, there are no children here, mm. man. And mm. I think it's very different, but very similar for Bushwick. Everyone there has gone through so much. Their kind of benchmark for, you know, who deserves what is 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 different. Mm. And I think for everyone involved, for this young man to have lost his life mm. was that, you know, kind of universal, mm. um, everyone across the board was impacted exactly. by that.
thinking about this new version of the, the film and talking about Bushwick, I felt as though there was no way of getting around talking about the community, which is largely an artist community, and the term hipster is thrown around constantly. Um, there is an author who participates in the film. His name is Alan Aaron Hall. He wrote a book called The Great Inversion. And he, he tackles the concept as well. Um, so I thought that, you know, I molded over and I thought I have to, I have to just put it out there because I think that without, in absence of that, we're not really getting to the crux of mm -hmm. what is happening right now in Bushwick. Mm -hmm. Um, what does hipster mean? And who are hipsters? And who are the, I, I just, I use natives because these are people who probably, who grew up like myself, mm -hmm. born and raised in Bushwick. Mm -hmm. And what you have happening right now is, you have people who were born and raised there having families uh, going to school, their children going to school there, and you have an influx of um, people who are coming to New York for a number of reasons, specifically in Bushwick, it's a largely an artist community um, that seems to be gravitating toward Bushwick, but from many different backgrounds. But the differences there are, um, you know, you have, when you have children, you have them grow up and go to school there, the type of connection and community that exists is very different, and the needs mm. is very different than, you know, a 20, 18, 19, year, 20 year old, 30 even, um, coming new to the community and want to, wanting to establish, you know, businesses and networking mm. and mm. connections. Mm. And in some ways, um, they are opposed to one another in mm. terms of the needs. In some mm. ways, there's no intersection. There mm. is no communication. Mm. Um, and in some ways there's isolation, mm -hmm. and sometimes there's clashing. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that is a subject that if you are talking about looking at what Bushwick is, you need to tackle. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a segment of the film where, you know, I'm tackling, you know, what what's a hipster? Mm -hmm. Who is a hipster, you know? And we hear all the kind of names, you know, the hair, the artist, this, that, mm -hmm. and who are natives, and, and what do people who might be new arrivals, what do they think of people who you know, were born and raised there. Sometimes they think that they're, you know, um, not social, um, entitled, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting to look at how the other groups might see one another. Um, so that is something that is tackled in the film. And I do think that in one of my goals in this film is to highlight um, how, when a community is in the midst of change, what can we do, kind of a best practices mm. type of approach, mm. what you can do to ensure that not necessarily the transition is smooth, but how you can be sensitive mm. and um, mindful mm. in, you know, when you arrive in a new community because there's an example of, you know, a, um, a family who owns a home there and a mural being yeah. put on their house mm. without their consent. And that is something that it, when you are from what I'm going to call the disenfranchised group, mm -hmm. the group that is not coming in with, you know, wealth, um, who are living you, in with a, you know, two, three kids in a home and a double income, and then you have a new new arrivals who are living like four, five, six to an apartment, and the the rent they can afford to pay more, mm -hmm. higher rents, mm -hmm. and how that dynamic shifts and changes things for the existing occupants. Mm -hmm. I think that when y you're arriving in a community and you come with a certain amount of um, access to resources, you do need to be mindful of how that impacts the existing community. I think you do have to be sensitive to how you refer, um, and it goes both ways, mm -hmm. but when you come in with, you know, the, the newer artist community does come in and has the ability to establish businesses, mm -hmm. um, to create art, mm -hmm. to create, you know, websites, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. kind of dictate what the mm -hmm. flavor of the, mm -hmm. of the new community yeah, is, the new community, yeah, um, yeah. without necessarily putting the, getting the input of the existing community, right. I don't think that that should be the case. Right. Um, I think the best practice is for the existing community to be involved in that dialogue as much as possible, and for those who are in those positions of power, those power brokers um, of the kind of uh, developing community, it's their responsibility in some ways to get the feedback of the existing community. So um, do artists cause gentrification? So that is a question that I put straight out there yes. in the film. Yes. And um, 
You know, it's interesting. We're in Fort Greene, and um, th at the time that I pr showed the film, um, it was at Brooklyn Academy of Music about 10 years ago. Um, the Barclays Center was being built in Fort Greene, Brooklyn, mm. and there was a bunch of people displaced um, for the um, the building of the Barclay Center, and there was a lot of dialogue. And at the time, the film was screening, and there was a Q and A. So it was this huge Q and A, and people were talking about that concept itself. And artist communities, when you think about them, um, because you talked before about how they can build those websites, mm -hmm. they have capital, so they can mm -hmm. move into the, they can get right. construction happening. Mm -hmm. They know about design. Mm -hmm. They know, or their parents know, or their parents' mm -hmm. friends know who to contact in city government. They're coming in with all these, what you referred to as, you know, terrific resources, right. and they're coming into a community where m many of those residents don't have those resources. Right. So do or artists cause gentrification is a huge question. Absolutely. And Galapa, say it again? Galapagos. Galapagos, I know from the island, and most mm -hmm. of you will know too, audience, that Charles Darwin, okay, discovered at the Galapagos Island, his concept of natural selection, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which basically is about <laughs> the survival of the mm -hmm, fittest. Mm -hmm. So to apply that to a geographic area, a place like Bushwick and other places around the nation where people call home, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. sounds a little imperialistic, um, intentionally divisive, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, privileged mm -hmm. entitlement. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we can answer that. Do artists cause gentrification? But I love how you, Stephanie Joshua, in your second film, just out, Bushwick Homecomings, the record, you show us three artists mm -hmm. who are of color, mm -hmm. who are born and bred and one of them still lives, but all of them still have very close ties because of their mothers still living there and family members still living in Bushwick. You show us those three artists of color mm -hmm. who are, they're artists. Right. And Absolutely. you give us another way to look mm -hmm. at this. Absolutely. And I really, really think that's something that is powerful, mm -hmm. which is a word you use in the end. So talk a little bit about your decision about that because I think it helps me with this. I can't answer mm -hmm. do artists cause gentrification, but I can look at these three artists of color still very grounded in Bushwick and their work is too mm -hmm. as telling me something that I didn't know before. Right, right. Well, um, thank you so much. Um, the artists that are um, featured in the film, there's a, a visual artist, her name is Danielle De Jesus, and she does her story is particularly impactful because there's a lot of visual art happening in Bushwick, literally on the streets, mm -hmm. on the walls. Um, DJ Evil D is part oh of gosh. part of Black Moon, so if you know <laughs> hip hop, you know DJ Evil D, um, and he's born and raised in, Bu in Bushwick, and still um, there, and still there, mm -hmm. and a force, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and then a writer, author, um, poet, her name is Vanessa Martier, and she does write in some of her work about Bushwick mm -hmm. specifically. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was important to incorporate their voices as the face of Bushwick. Mm -hmm. um, I don't necessarily agree with the concept of old and new Bushwick because uh, people I know are still living there. Mm -hmm. They are Bushwick. I think mm -hmm. that change um, does occur, and I'm not anti-change. I don't think anyone in the film is anti-change. Mm -hmm. I don't. I think everyone likes improvement. I know that some change is uncomfortable. Some change is unfair. Mm -hmm. um, I think that artists are at times, whether they believe it or not, they are a pawn in the equation as well because mm -hmm. artists are often, as evidenced by um, you know this neighborhood, they are often, they end up being displaced themselves. Yeah. And this is a question that I posed to the author, Alan Ehrenhall, about artists when they're in a community and they're kind of helping you know in their own way to create their their voice but artists can be very transient mm. in terms of um their mm. their population mm. but also when the these the neighborhood is you know safe and now it's kind of trendy most people themselves find that they are um, kind of displaced from the community because now it's the trendy place to be. You talk with former drug dealers and residents in Bushwick. You talk with researcher and writer. You mentioned him. Um, 
uh, Aaron Halt. You talk with three artists of color who live in Bushwick. You talk with the community activist mm -hmm. um, who's the nephew of the person who owned the building mm -hmm. where that mural was put without any consultation mm -hmm. whatsoever. Um, you talk with even an anthropologist, Rick Curtis, who's at John Jay School of Criminal Justice. But you don't talk with one politician. Right. So <laughs> I have to say that there's a lot when you make a film, and especially a doc, that you don't see. And I outreach to politicians. Ah. Um, I won't give any names no. here, but um, most did not want to ah. participate. I did outreach specifically. Um, I think that I, it's a complicated um, topic for them, mm. and it's hard for anyone, especially a politician, to want to be on record mm. saying that they are That's for sad. or against, especially since there's always legislation for rezoning that they have to navigate and supervise. But I, I definitely outreach to politicians and you know and 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 other entities as well and i won't say names but some were not did not want to participate some did not want to be on record so that's were, a really good thing yeah. for us to think about and to know about but your experience growing up in any neighborhood or working in a neighborhood really is about the people it's about the interactions that you have with one another. That can't be taken away. And I did want to highlight the end of that film, all of the ama my amazing experiences growing up in Bushwick and all the wonderful people that I grew up with and who are still there and um, still fighting the good fight as well. Um, I think that that is the message that I wanted to leave with because I also say at the end of the film, especially in New York City, all of us might find ourselves needing to go elsewhere, relocate, and we may be seen now as a gentrifier because you don't know, right? And so I feel like moving, understanding that no one can take away my history. Um, at the same time, if I go elsewhere, I will be there at, with compassion and with respect for what exists before me. And that's where I wanted to kind of leave that film um, on that note. That's beautifully said. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, just one more thing. So uh, Bushwick uh, Homecomings, the record is just coming out of Bushwick Film Festival mm -hmm. last month. And uh, for you to find out what's happening with Stephanie Joshua and Bushwick Homecomings, the record, go on their website. You might want to check that out. And the website is... Um, um. The website is www.bushwickhomecomings.com, and there is a Facebook page that's a community page that oh. has been, it, if you want, it, community members can submit images of themselves in Bushwick, oh. so it's been going on for two years now. The Facebook page is Bushwick Homecomings, and the Instagram page is Bushwick Homecomings as well. I love that. Yeah. That's yeah. Really, really good really to know. Yeah. It was a pleasure having you here you on What's so the 411. Much. Thank you so much. So there you have it. Another terrific happening right here in New York City, specifically in Brooklyn. What's the 411? I'm LaVon Roberson, and I'll see you next time. 411, who's got the 411? 411, they got the 411. Who's got the 411?